guest on Kelman's Corner today is Bill Beck, who spent 48 years in the front offices of baseball teams. We'll be back with Bill after these words. Our guest today is Bill Beck, who spent 48 years working in the front offices of several minor and major league baseball teams. Bill, it's great to see you again. Howard, it's good to see you, and it's been many years. So uh, we go back, what, 40-some years ago, maybe close to 50. I hate to say it. <laughs> well, I, I remember well the day I met you, April 20th, 1974. It was the first game I ever broadcast in Indianapolis, and you came in as broadcaster with the Omaha Royals. And I remember how helpful you were to me and how nice you were. And I also remember the Omaha Royals that day had a young third baseman named George Brett. He, he did better than both of us. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it. Uh, I remember meeting you in Indianapolis. I can't believe you remember the date. But, yes, uh, if we do go back a while. Yeah, and George became one of the all-time greats. Could you see in him at that time? the talent that he could become a terrific player? Uh, I'm kind of hesitating with this answer because you're not going to believe this. I thought he would become a gold glove third baseman. He did win one, but he never concentrated on defense that much. And uh, he became one of baseball's all-time great hitters. I never dreamed he'd become the kind of hitter he did. That first year in Omaha, and uh, – I, I'm my years run together, but he hit like 200 and uh, just barely over it and didn't really do very well. But uh, uh, the rest is history, so to speak. So at the end of the 74 season, you left the Omaha Royals to join the parent team, the Kansas City Royals, as director of team travel. Tell us about that experience with Kansas City. Yeah, that was really interesting because uh, um, the Royals brought me in to be, uh, uh, oh, I don't even know what you'd call it, kind of a marketing person. And I didn't really have any background in that. And uh, anyway, they had a couple of switches, said, well, you've done all the travel with the Omaha club. Why don't you do the uh, travel with the big leg club? And in addition, I was coordinator of the season ticket program, which was a wonderful program developed by owner Ewing Kaufman. And what it did, it gave me a chance to really get to know business leaders in the Kansas City community who sold season tickets for the team. And uh, uh, so in the off season, I did that. And then the season, I handled all the travel. And it was the most unique uh, uh, job, I guess, in baseball, because those two things really don't normally fit together. And uh, but I, I relished those 10 years doing both jobs. What's it like being a traveling secretary, you're working closely with the front office, you're working closely with the ball players, with the airlines and so forth. Uh, well, you're right on all those counts. My wife has the best description. I was a babysitter for millionaires. And uh, <laughs> uh, you do whatever you kind of need to do. And uh, yeah, it's buses, baggage, uh, airlines, hotel rooms, meal money, game tickets. Game tickets can be a real problem. You know, you you turn them in. Players are allowed at the big league level six comp tickets for each game, four in the two in the family section, or four in the family section, two in the guest section. And inevitably, I do it. You know, hour and a half, two hours before the game, ten minutes before the game, a player would call from. I'd be in the press box, and they'd call from the clubhouse or the dugout and say, geez, I forgot to left, list, leave four tickets for my aunt from Muskegon. And uh, so I'd be scrambling around to get tickets left again. That, that was kind of a pain. It wasn't anything complicated, but that happened quite often. And as you got there, the Royals were coming into their own. They won three straight divisional titles in 1976, 7, and 8. That's exactly right. And actually, we uh, we won four in the last of 
five years. We missed in 79, but we won in 80 and then uh, lost the World Series to the Phillies. But 76, 7, and 8, that was really the turning point in the Royals franchise. Uh, they were no longer considered, you know, a brand new franchise and a real threat. And uh, 76 was a wonderful American League Championship Series with the Yankees. Old baseball fans like you and me will remember Chris Shambliss in the final game in the final inning, hit a home run to put the Yankees in the World Series. 77, we had them down three games, excuse me, two games to one at home and lost uh, games three or four and five. Uh, and uh, then in 78, we lost the playoffs in four games. So, and those were all against the Yankees. So it was, it was quite a time to be with the Royals. Let's talk about 1980 for a moment. As mentioned, you won the pennant that year. You beat the Yankees in the LCS. And George Brett ended up at 390, but he was batting over 400 in the middle of September. What was that whole experience like for everyone with the ball club? Well, uh, it was just pure excitement going to the ball club ballpark. And, you know, this was the days way before cell phones and uh, the mass media thing. It was newspaper writers, and they were coming in from all over the country to cover it, from the New York Times to the Los Angeles Times. And uh, uh, the pressure got on him. He, he was over 400, but he also had a 30-game hitting streak at one point. And uh, he, <laughs> it, it finally ended the hitting streak, and he, he – kind of went in the tailspin. He went all the way to 390. Um, and if he'd had five more hits that year, he would have uh, hit 400. Uh, George only played 116 games that year, but he drove in 117 runs. Uh, it was the greatest year I've ever seen a player have. And I remember on August 12th, he went like, I don't know, I can't remember, four for four against Milwaukee and him standing at second base with his arms up in the air. And the scoreboard said George Brett is now hitting 409. Um, and uh, it, it was magical. Uh, and I was with Tony Gwynn in San Diego. They were by far the two best hitters that I've ever been around. Uh, but for one year, uh, you couldn't top what George did. George said something, and I learned a lot from this statement he made, and other people may have too, but he said, everything was going great to the middle of September when all of a sudden I started to try to hit 400, and he put undue pressure on himself, and that's why he didn't make it. So the lesson of not trying too hard. I think that's very accurate, and uh, I remember when the hitting streak ended, uh, we were in Minnesota, and uh, he was just exhausted uh, because it was all tied together, the 30-game hitting streak and hitting over 400. And uh, uh, there's no question he put extra pressure on himself. And he wasn't, you know, Kansas City's a small market, and he wasn't used to all the national attention because in those days, all the writers were, you know, they, the national writers would go everywhere, and they were all following George. You develop friendships in the minor leagues and the big leagues. I'm sure you've made many of them. And one of them that you made in Omaha was with Jack McKeon, Trader Jack. Tell us about your relationship and your friendship with Jack McKeon. Um, <laughs> I met him in December of 1968. So that's over 50 years. Well, I think it's over 50 years ago. I, my math isn't real good. Um, he, uh, uh, managed the Omaha club the first two years I was in baseball and we won the American association championship both years. And I thought, boy, this is easy. This is going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> well, it didn't stay that way. Um, and then in 73, he went to Kansas city with the big leg club and was the first manager in what is now Kauffman Stadium, but it was a brand new stadium in uh, 1973. He had a lot to do with me getting to Kansas City because he kept telling him uh, with the Royals, the front office, so oh, you got a guy down there named Bill Beck and he can really help you up here. So he had a lot to do with that. Jack got fired in 75. I called Charlie Finley and talked to him. He owned the Oakland A's and, uh, Charlie 
wanted to know why he got fired, and I won't go into all those details, but uh, Charlie and I just hit it off for some reason, and I just called him out of the blue. Well, a month later, he hires Jack to uh, scout the American League playoffs in 75, and then uh, Chuck Tanner leaves the A's, and Jack becomes a manager 76. He gets fired in 76 by Finley, but Finley then uh, Bobby Winkles quits in 77, and Jack manages again. Then Jack gets fired, and he ends up as the assistant general manager because Finley had a front office of six people, and uh, Jack got a lot of experience out of that. And then uh, Jack went on to San Diego, um, was working as an assistant to the GM. The GM gets fired. Uh, Jack gets a job. And then he brings me to San Diego. Now I'm going to fast forward because he went to Cincinnati. And then uh, years later, I'm in Florida and uh, the Marlins are looking for a manager. And Jeffrey Loria, the owner, says, tell me about this old guy, Jack McKeon. And so uh, I didn't oversell it, but I just said everywhere he goes, the first year he goes, they really improve. And I gave him some statistics in uh Kansas City, Oakland, and uh, Cincinnati. And so he ends up hiring Jack as a manager. So we've kind of helped each other back and forth over, uh, what, 40, 50 years. That's great. We'll have more with Bill Beck after these messages. Bill, you mentioned going to the San Diego Padres and working there. They won the uh, division and the pennant in 1984. Tell us the whole experience about working for the Padres. Well, it was uh, – I, I I had never been the media relations director, uh, but I did a lot of media relations work in Kansas City. So I got hired as the media relations director in San Diego and uh, – they had never had a winning record in San Diego. The club started in 1969. This was 1984. And midway through the year, you could see we had a chance to win the division. And uh, had we had added that the team had added in the last couple of years um, from the Yankees, Goose Gossage in relief. Uh, they added Steve Garvey from the Dodgers, which was a big move. And they added Craig Nettles, the third baseman. So we go on, we win the division, and then we win the National League pennant in a dramatic series against the Cubs. My God, we lost the first game at Wrigley Field 16-1. to Rick Sutcliffe hit a home run, the starting pitcher. Then we lose the second game 6-1, to and we're flying back to San Diego. This is best of five, and we're down 0-2. My whole hope was that we could win one game. Well, we won game three, seven to one. Garvey hits a dramatic home run on a Saturday night to win game four off Lee Smith. Now we're tied. And then we win game five on a Sunday in the most dramatic fashion ever, uh, uh, coming from three down and beat the Cubs six to three. Um, and that was Sunday evening. And Tuesday, we were going to start the World Series against the Detroit Tigers. And we had to get media credentials out for all the writers and people coming to cover. That was, I didn't sleep much in that, uh, what, wow. close to 48 hour period. Yeah. But it was a wonderful time and great. And we had some decent teams after that, but we never did win the division again. And we were there through the 1990 season. So I was there actually seven full seasons. And I believe then you were with the Florida Marlins since their inception, their first year of playing was 1993. That's correct. I got hired the 1st of January, 1992, and I was director of season and group ticket sales. And uh, uh, we we did great because everybody wanted baseball. Heck, I think we sold 18,000 season tickets and we drew uh, close to 3 million people the first year. Well, I then, the traveling secretary quit. So Dave Dombrowski, after the 93 season, that was the first year, he said, 
come back over and work in the baseball side because you have a lot of experience there as opposed on the sales side. So I did 94, the horrible strike hit in August, the Florida Panthers hockey team was about to start up. Wayne Huizenga owned those two teams along with the Dolphins football team. They asked me to go over and start the season ticket program with the Panthers. And I was over there six months and uh, had a wonderful time getting them off the ground. Then uh, baseball ended that crazy strike thing, and uh, I went back to baseball. So my start in, in Florida was really unusual, and uh, it was a lot of fun. 1997, you won the World Series, defeating Cleveland. Tremendous season with a great manager, Jim Leland, who, by the way, I feel very strongly should be in the Hall of Fame. But anyway... That 97 season, Larry Rothschild and I are friends. He was the pitching coach, and you had a big parade after winning it all. And Larry said to me, oh, they'll get a new ballpark. The fans here are so much involved and love it. And uh, the parade was incredible, but the new ballpark didn't come, and then there was a fire sale. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we, now think of this. We won the World Series in a dramatic seven-game series against Cleveland in 97. And then Wayne Heisinger had lost a lot of money. Um, and he said, sell off all the players. Well, we sold off almost everybody uh, or traded them. Gary Sheffield, um, Bobby Bonilla, uh, Charles Johnson, Kevin Brown, Al Leiter. I mean, I could go on and on. So to make a long story short, in 98, we lose 108 games, and Jim Leland is the manager. Um, no, yeah, he's the manager, and it almost drove him crazy. And Jim did a wonderful job in 97 pulling that team together, and uh, uh, it was a nightmare in 98, and he resigned after that and uh, went to Colorado for a while. And then, of course, in Detroit, he did a fabulous job. But uh, that was horrible, having to go through that. And everything gets built up again, though. And in 2003, you win the World Series again, beating the Yankees in six games. Yeah, and Jack McCann was the manager, and he'd been brought in on May 10th of that year, replacing Jeff Torbor. And uh, uh, the team played all right, but nothing great. And I remember Jack's big line is, Every week, let's say for their seven games, let's go four and three, four and three. We're not going to try and win it all in a week or a month. And we just gradually each week and each month, we got better, uh, ended up in the wild card, beat San Francisco in the playoff or the wild card round, and then uh, uh, beat the Cubs in a dramatic seven, seven game series we're ending in Chicago to go to the World Series and then uh, beat the Yankees in six games. And that, from my standpoint, was the most fun of any season I've had in baseball. When I met Jeffrey Loria, the Marlins owner, I told him, I said, Bill Beck and I are good friends. And he said, point blank, Bill Beck is responsible for us winning the World Series in 2003. And then I said, because he recommended Jack McKeon and Jeffrey said, absolutely. Yeah, he, he was very good about giving me credit. And he had bought the team in 2002, right before spring training. And uh, uh, we did okay in 02, but not great. And then in 03, we end up winning the World Series. But uh, that was the end of the magic. We were over 500 the next three years. Um, but also, we, we sold off a lot of players after 04, and uh, it was never the same. So, and then Jeffrey sold the club in September of 2017 to the group headed by uh, Bruce Sherman and Derek Jeter. And uh, uh, I was out of baseball at the end of the 17 season, but that's okay. I mean, my God, 48 years and I, I was no spring chicken then. Well, one of the things, one of the perks about being a traveling secretary, director of team travel, is you get a World Series share, you get a playoff share. So that must have been nice that those times that happened. <laughs> I'm laughing because, yeah, we beat Cleveland in, 
And my wife had no idea there would be extra money. And uh, this is 97. I said, we just want a lot of money. Well, what are you talking about? I said, uh-huh. uh, player share. And it was very generous and came in very handy, both 97 and 2003. So I've been very blessed because, as you know, a lot of guys are in this game forever and never get to the World Series. So uh, I got there four times and won it twice, both with the team in Florida. Ernie Banks may have wanted to speak to you about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They they never did, yeah. The game has really changed now in terms of the fact that there's so much so data driven and front offices are analytical and it's much different than it used to be and not necessarily for the better either. Um, absolutely. I mean, I'm still in touch with some traveling secretaries, and for the most part, um, they're not real happy. And, and I I make the statement. Gee, I'm glad I was in the game when I was in the game because it was quite a bit different. And you're going through something right now that doesn't have to do with the front office or the Players Association, but the COVID thing. You're not traveling. You don't have access to the players. And as you and I know, because I did do some broadcasting too, um, having that access is vital, but you do the best you can without it. Bill, it's great seeing you again and spending time with you. Thank you so very much. Great, Howard. Thanks for reaching out, and we'll stay in contact. It's Bill Beck. We'll be back after these words. Thanks so much to our guest today, Bill Beck. See you next week.